Well, good morning, North Star. My name's Casey. I'm so excited to get to be with you this morning, and we're going to have the opportunity, as CA just said, to get to be together quite a bit over the next couple of days. We look forward to seeing you uh, tomorrow and Tuesday as well, as we get to celebrate everybody's favorite time of year, the most wonderful time of the year. And this morning, we're wrapping up this Christmas series that we've been in as we've been slowly but surely working through Luke 2, building to where we're at today. So if you've got your Bibles, if you wouldn't mind opening up uh, Luke 2, we're going to start off in verse 8. But as you're flipping there, I don't know if you guys saw the story. It came out a couple of weeks ago about the little boy, I believe, in Michigan who was being adopted. He was being brought into his new family. He'd been in foster care with him, and they were signing the adoption papers for him to come into their family. Well, he didn't want to just celebrate by himself, so he invited his entire class, his entire kindergarten class, his teachers, the school administration. He wanted everybody to to come celebrate and be a part of the big day. And so there's this really cool picture of this little boy with a bow tie on sitting at this seat in this courtroom and behind him, every seat is filled and they've got signs and they've got posters and it's all of his classmates, it's his teachers, it's the school administration as they're supporting him as he's being adopted into this family. And the story goes viral once it hit the internet and got online. And it really is an amazing thing. You need to get on after church, check it out because it's a really cool story. But I think one of the reasons we love it so much is because we love to be included in good news. See, this kid didn't want to just have this moment to himself with he and his new parents. He wanted all of his classmates, he wanted his teachers to get to experience this good news with him. And this passage that we're looking at this morning is the greatest news that we could get. And it wasn't just for some of us, but it was for all of us. So check this out. Luke 2, verse 8 is where we're kicking off. It says this, and in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. If you like to take notes, uh, underline, highlight that last portion of verse 10 that will be for all people. And verse 11 says this, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. That statement that just came out of the angel's mouth is a statement that goes on to change the course of history. Because this message that was brought, this boy that has been born just a few miles away that they're getting ready to go visit is going to be the one who changes everything. And he's not just changing it for the elite. He's not just changing it for the religious scholars. He's not just changing it for the ones who can afford it. It is good news for all people. Every single person. This news was meant for them. And I think it's so fitting that the ones receiving this message from this angel are a group of shepherds who at the time would have been the lowest of the low in society. They're the first ones to hear that this message is too for them. And so what we're going to be talking about this morning for the next few moments that we have together is who did Jesus come for? Who did he come for? Because I believe that we've got the tendency sometimes to exclude ourselves from the end of verse 10. Well, I get that it's for all people, but there's no way it could be for me. There's no way that that could fit with where I've been. Hopefully by the end of our time today, we'll realize that Jesus came for the religious. He came for those who are good. He came for the bad. He came for every single person. So would you pray with me? Father, as we kick off our time this morning, Lord, I just pray that um, no matter how we walked into this room today, no matter um, what we walked in carrying during this uh, Christmas season, Father, I pray that for the next few moments that we'd be able to have an honest and real time with you. 
Father, and that we would be able to evaluate our hearts on where we stand with you. Because the reality is, this message that was given 2,000 years ago from this angel to these shepherds, God, that message still applies to us in 2019 as we get ready to flip the clock into 2020. That message hasn't changed, that hope hasn't changed, and the promise of Jesus Christ hasn't changed. Lord, I pray that we embrace it, that we run with it, and we walk out of here in full confidence knowing that today. Lord, we love you, we thank you. It's your name that we pray. Amen. So, who did Jesus come for? Here's our first thought. Jesus came for religious people. Why? Because religious activity won't save you. This would have fit a lot of people during this time period. This would have fit a lot of the people that Jesus was going to end up being around and a lot of the people that, man, they just didn't like him at the end of the day. There's even a portion of Matthew 15 where Jesus is having a conversation with the Pharisees and he asks them why they're more willing to keep their religious tradition than keep the commandment. You see, it had gotten so instilled that they live by these traditions and these strict guidelines and that is how you live life. And Jesus came and completely broke the mold and changed everything completely changed perception and he gave us a new reality. And last week we got to talk about the difference between religion and relationship and we got a really great breakdown of it. So I encourage you get back if you weren't here and go check that out because it's explained so well that there is this difference between having a relationship with Jesus Christ and just being religious and just following guidelines and just following a code that we grew up with. The way I think about it is like this. There's this really cool thing in a lot of schools now. It started coming around kind of towards the back end of when I was at high school. But if you've got perfect attendance through the semester, okay? So you show up every single day, Monday through Friday, when school's in session, you show up and you're able to keep like a B in the class, you get to exempt the final, okay? If you are a bad test taker, that is a message straight from the Lord. Like that is the greatest news of all time. You're just telling me if I show up and I can turn in my assignments through the year, keep a B. I don't have to take the final, which is going to go over everything. I'll be there, right? So you're willing to roll out of bed, you're sick, you're running a fever, don't care. I'm not taking that final, right? We would do these things just so we didn't have to do it. And it was all based on our attendance. And so you would get to the end of the semester, the teacher would look back, see that you've been there every single day, and go, okay, you're exempt. The problem is, the same is not true of our relationship with Jesus. We're not going to be able to stand before the Lord one day and just look at our attendance record from church and go, all right, so we're good to go, right? I mean, I came when I was sick. I came two days before the Christmas Eve service. I'm gonna be back here in two days. Like, that's double, right? It doesn't work like that. And I think we miss that so many times. Just saying grace at dinner, just coming to church every single Sunday, that's not what saves us. What saves us is the transforming power of Jesus Christ and what he does in our hearts. There's an old statement that says this, anyone who thinks uh, that they are Christian just by sitting in church must also believe that you can just be a car by sitting in a garage. And the same's true. Just because we come to church and just because we gather together, it doesn't mean that we are followers of Christ. We have to surrender our lives to him. There's this really great passage, Romans 3, verse 21. I want you guys to check it out. It's going to be on your screen. It's in your outline as well. It says this. Now we see how God does make us acceptable to him. The law and the prophets tell how we become acceptable, and it isn't by obeying the law of Moses. God treats everyone alike. 
He accepts people only because they have faith in Jesus Christ. That's huge right there in verse 22. Verse 23, all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But God treats us much better than we deserve. And because of Christ Jesus, he freely accepts us and sets us free from our sins. When Jesus was born, that little boy that those shepherds are getting ready to go visit, if we kept reading Luke 2, that little boy that they're going to visit that's sitting in that manger, he became the only way to the Father for the churched and unchurched alike. He is the only option. But Jesus came for those who were holding to those strict standards. He didn't just cast them aside and go, no, 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 we got to start from a clean slate. I need people that don't have any background in religion. It's not what Jesus did at all. So Jesus came for religious people. But check this out, our second point. Jesus also came for moral people. Why? Because good works won't save you. And we think about that word moral, we could substitute a lot. Good good enough, tries hard. But Jesus came for moral people. I was thinking about this as we are preparing for this week. and <clears throat> There's a great book um, by Max Lucado called In the Grip of Grace, and he gives this illustration. But I want to start it off like this. If you've ever been in any elementary school, any middle school, any high school, I don't care where you are across the country, you could walk into that school during the school day, go down to the gym, and if school's in session, you are going to find a group. Typically, that group can be three to five, or if it's become a big deal, it'll grow to 10 plus of young Boys gathered underneath a basketball goal. And they're not playing basketball. They're not shooting. They're all attempting to do one thing and one thing only. And it's touch the rim. Every young boy has the dream of touching the rim, right? And you will gather everybody together. If you can get net, you're calling your friends, right? But when you get rim, you're the man, all right? Like, that is a huge deal. I remember being in middle school and high school, and you just want to jump and touch everything, right? So you're walking through a doorway. Boom, got that. Check it off the list, okay? The pipes in the... Um, Garage, the parking deck. Ah, got it. All right. I've worked my way up. It's time for the rim. We all live to jump and touch the rim. Okay? I did it once. Nobody was there, but that's not important. It's not important. So that's a huge deal. And what we do is we compare who's got more bounce than the other guy. Who can jump higher than him? And you've got this whole ranking system, and that is how... Guys determine popularity through school. It's just a weird thing, right? But in Max Lucado's book, In the Grip of Grace, he says this. So there's this huge gap that stands between us and stands between perfection, living that perfect life like Jesus did. There's a massive gap. So it's like this. He says to reach that, it would be like standing here on earth and saying, okay, great. You want to be perfect? You want to do everything you can to be perfect to go to heaven? I need you to stand here and jump, and you got to touch the moon. Jump and touch the moon? You can't touch the rim, right? You're just not going to get there. It is an impossible feat. That is how much stands between where we are and our sinful nature and perfection known as Jesus. And we think that there's enough good that we can do that's going to bridge that gap. That there's enough that we can do. There is enough doorbells to ring. There's enough cans to be collected. We will do what we can trying to bridge that gap, and you're never going to make it. It is impossible to save ourselves based off good works alone. So here's what we do. We begin to play this game, much like we do in those gyms across the country. 
None of us can jump and touch the moon. But here's what I'm going to do. I know that I can jump higher than you can. It might be three feet off the ground, and you can only get two feet, but I can jump higher. And we begin to compare ourselves to everybody else. We play this little comparison game of, well, I'm living my life better than that. God, surely in your wisdom and in your power, you would see, God, that, man, I'm, I'm not great, I'm not perfect, but I'm not nearly as bad as this person. I'm not that awful, right? So God will let me in because I'm good enough. I've lived my life pretty well, and compared to somebody else, man, I'm a lot better. So surely I'm going to get into heaven because I'm good. It's not how it works. God's eye, sin is sin. Falling short is falling short. Check out Ephesians 2, verse 8. It says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. It's for by grace you've been saved. It's not by your works. It's not by being good enough. It's not by being nice enough. Yes, we do those things because of how much we love the Lord and we want to look like him. But it doesn't save us. It's not going to be the thing at the end of the day that we can stand before our creator and go, God, this is what I've got. This is my resume. I'm bringing it to you. I'm applying for a spot in heaven. This is what I accomplished while I was on earth. I lived like this. I did that. It's all going to fall short. It's never going to reach that spectrum. We're never going to be able to bridge that gap. But the beginning of Ephesians 2.8 gives us the answer. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That's the thing that changed the game. That is what changed everything. Yeah, you can't do it all by yourself. There's not enough good that you can do that's going to get you to heaven. So I'm sending my son to earth, and he's going to live that perfect life that nobody else can. And he's going to be punished for it. He's going to lose his life and die on a cross so that we have the opportunity at life. And he's going to defeat death and get up three days later. That is what changed everything. Jesus came so that we didn't have to live to that standard of just trying to be good enough. Because I'm just going to tell you, if we're just trying to be good enough without Jesus, it's going to leave you feeling empty. Even all of those good and moral and just things that we do, if we're doing and operating from them separately from Jesus, we're going to be left wondering what's missing. And it's a relationship with the one who can change everything. It's placing your faith and your trust in the one who came and gave his life so that you could have one. So we've gotten this idea. Jesus came for people who had a background in religion. He didn't just cast them to the side. He didn't just say, we can't can't use you. We also know that Jesus came for those that were trying to live a good life on their own. That think they can operate just on their own volition. That what they do is going to be good enough to cover them at the end of the day. Jesus came for those two. 
But there's a third party that Jesus also came for that I think we're all going to be able to relate to in some form or fashion. It's this. Jesus came for guilt-ridden people. Why? Because no sin is bigger than the cross. I think of the three categories of people that we're kind of looking at this morning, and we could, man, go for days and days, this might be the most self-aware group, the guilt-ridden, right? Because the guilt-ridden are the one who read Luke 2, and it gets to the end of verse 10 where it says this message is for all people, and they go, for almost all the people. It couldn't be for me. There's no way that that could apply to my life. I would call this category the, this is too good to be true, right? I don't know if you've ever had one of these, this is too good to be true moments because you just have this idea that the world is not on your side and it's out to get you and that this is just another form of it. I want you to check out Romans 5, verse 7. It says this, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not Christ died for you when you got your life together. Not when you got rid of that junk and those skeletons in your closet that you don't want anybody to know about, then Christ died for you. While we were still sinners, while we were still operating completely separate from the creator of the universe, Christ died for us. And so here's what we're doing when we live guilt-ridden. We're focused on trying to pay a debt that's already been paid. We're trying to pay off something that's already been purchased on your behalf. It'd be like somebody giving you a gift card. They're paying for your groceries at the grocery store. Right? They want you, it is a holiday, goodwill, here, come buy my groceries. Somebody buys your groceries for you and you go home and you look at them and go, this is awesome, it was a great gift. But I can't use them, I didn't buy them. I can't cook with this, I didn't, I didn't make the purchase. Somebody already bought them on your behalf. Somebody did it for you. I know, but I didn't. I wasn't the one to do it. Guys, there's nothing that we can do. No amount of sin that is too small and adds up. And no amount of sin that is too big for Jesus to handle and for Jesus to own. See, when he went to the cross and he died for us, he wasn't just dying for those little moments in life, right? He wasn't just dying for the time we like peeked at somebody's middle school quiz, right, in math class and you got one answer. That's not just it. It's not just the little stuff. That's what we like to think, is that, yeah, Jesus can handle the little stuff, and that's what he died for, the white lies, the cheating, cutting somebody off in traffic, and then yelling at them, right? That's, he died for the whole thing. Every bit of you, the parts of you you don't want anybody else to know about, those things that you've kept hidden from everybody else because you're terrified of what it's going to do to you, how it's going to affect you, what people are going to think, those things that you lay awake at night and worry about. He died for it. 
Yeah, but Casey, you don't, man, you don't know what that looks like in my life. I don't. I don't. And I, I believe that each and every one of us sitting in here probably has some moment that we wouldn't want anybody else to know about that we feel would be too big and people's perceptions would change of us if we told them about it. But he knows. And he loves you anyways. He's choosing to love you. You were worth the price. It doesn't matter if you're guilt ridden and you can't look past where you've been. It doesn't matter if you're just trying to live a good enough life or maybe you've just grown up in church and you've never fully accepted Christ for who he is and placed your faith and your hope in him. He came for each and every one of them. And you know, we're in this holiday season, we're in this Christmas season, and everybody's gearing up for three days later, right? I mean, that is the big, big thing. And then you think about this message, this idea for all people. And maybe you don't feel that you fit into one of these ideas. That you've placed your, your life in Jesus. You've placed your hope in him. But I guarantee there's somebody around you in your life that hasn't. And that would identify with one of these things. And the Christmas story wasn't something that we just wanted to keep to ourselves. The Christmas story wasn't one of these things where the shepherds go and they visit Jesus and they walk back to their old jobs and go, guys, that was pretty cool, wasn't it? We're just gonna hang out here. We'll talk about it a little more. Scripture says, after the shepherds left Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, they walked away. They went back to their jobs proclaiming and glorifying the name of God. And they begin to tell people what they saw. And thus started the ministry of Jesus, of people having their lives changed by this person. My prayer for us is that we realize that this is for all people and that we are one of those people. And that even in our lowest moments, even in our darkest places, Christ loved us. He cared for us. He died for us. When we can begin to understand and embrace that. Man, I can't tell you what it does and how it changes your outlook on life. The freedom that you can find from breaking the chains of religion and morality and guilt and substituting them for the love of Christ. Man, it changes everything. And it changes everyone. I pray that we embrace that today, individually and as a community, that we would recognize and understand that this message too was for us. Let's pray. Father, I don't know any other way. Um, to begin other than saying thank you. Because over 2,000 years ago, the world was getting ready to change, God. 
because you are sending your one and only son down to earth. And it wasn't so that he could live in a palace. He was born in a pigsty, in a manger. And God, you sent him for us. For the rich, for the poor. Didn't matter the color of skin. Didn't matter the background. God, Jesus was coming for every single one of us. And Father, my prayer is that today, Father, that we would embrace that with everything that we've got. God, that we would let go of our religious tradition, that we would let go of our good works that are operating apart from faith. And God, that we would shed ourselves of that guilt that we have a tendency to carry around and bundle up and package with us every time we try to move on. God, may we walk out of here as free people today because we know we're loved by the one that created us. And that we know that we were worth the price that was paid through Jesus' death. And he would do it again just for us. Lord, thank you for that hope. Thank you for that freedom. And may we walk out of here in that today. Lord, we love you. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.